I mention it's as if a jackal has set fire to the wood. Okay, so the tree itself has got all sorts of interesting aspects to it as well. As I mentioned already, it's high in tannin. So um, most of the plant parts can actually be used to make decoctions and antiseptic wipes and creams for wounds. A ringworm has been known to treat dysentery and even back in the day, uh, diseases such as leprosy. So absolutely marvelous. And if you have a look at this magnificent specimen, just look at the size of it. Look at the size of it. It is a beauty. It is a beauty. Have you got that sense? Encapsulate that. Senzo is parked about 35, 40 meters away to try and get this entire tree in. So you can see that by the size of me, I am nothing in the life of this tree. And where we have it is it's growing along a drainage line. Um, this is the Milwati just behind me, which is the major drainage system that runs through Juma. And these trees are very water loving and good indicators of water. And so be it as well. The root structure that's going under the ground here is probably as big, if not bigger, than the canopy above. So you can imagine the anchorage that's happening here and the stabilizing effect it's having on the river system as well. This is not a permanent river, but when water flows and floods down here, it will hold this entire bank system in place, which from an ecological point of view is very, very important. But as I walk back, Senza is going to zoom out again and just imagine how many birds and animals might be living in this tree. And when the tree drops all the leaves, huge organic material on the floor for insects, shelter, ground cover. Sharon, if you could hug it, you should come and hug it. I like to hug trees with lots of energy. Most welcome any time. It is probably one of the most beautiful trees you find in the savannah biome. And invariably, they're always green, apart from a few moments in the year when they drop all those leaves and then get them all back again. Okay, so Faith, if I still have a moment, I was going to talk to everybody quickly about the leaf. A little bit of picture breakup. Okay, so I've got three branches over here on the dashboard, and I'm going to start with the one that everybody knows. Everybody knows this one. This is the magic quarry. Okay, and the leaves are quite tough. You see the side that's very undulating. And if I look underneath, there's no hairs whatsoever. It's smooth, it's clean. Okay, so that is the magic quarry. And if I now compare the magic quarry to the hairy quarry, let me just, this is the branch there. Here is the hairy quarry. Here is the leaf versus the magic quarry next to each other. Very similar, but if I turn them side on, Look how undulating the magic worry is, the one on the left. And then when I turn them backwards, upside down, if you get right in on their sense, can you get any, any hairs? There's very fine hairs on the base of this leaf. And this is the hairy worry, the one that you can potentially confuse the jackalberry with. So I'm going to hold this here just so that we're all very sure. And have a look at this beauty. This is a branch, a new branch or new leaf off of a jackalberry itself. And when they are young, when the leaves are new, when that tree sheds all its leaves, all the new leaves that come through have this reddish sort of tinge. These are brand, brand new, and they will actually go a bit redder than that. And uh, that is a very easy way to identify jackalberry versus hairy gory. But then if I show you the back of these two, first of all, the hairy gory is in my right hand and the jackalberry is in my left. The, there's a, a toughness. The hairy gory is a lot tougher. This is a bit smoother. And then when you turn sideways, they look almost identical. But when you turn them over, the difference is in the hairs at the base over here. So very easy to not confuse. You can actually clearly see that on the camera. Unfortunately, this one has been eaten a little bit by insects. But the coloration, and there's all these little red spots there which you can see, very easy to identify. And the, the easiest factor, to be honest, in the, the, the jackalberry, first of all, the red leaves, and when they get that big, very easy to identify. But it's the small babies that occur, that grow, that I always found my students always, always struggled to identify. 
Well, I wonder, and Francis, how old is that jackalberry? That is a, a very good question. I'm going to say it's more than, more than 30 years, but I really don't know. I have not been here to see it grow, and I don't know how fast they grow. Because they are a very slow-growing fruit, the fruit's are very slow to ripen, um, the tree itself is probably also quite slow-growing, but because it's in the moisture, it grows beautifully. Okay, so here is the tree. It grows all year round because it's got the water there. Have a look at that. That's the same example there. If we go down a bit, sense there's the bark. Very easy to identify the bark. And when the fruits are here, they are sort of small berry-like things that often aren't allowed to get ripe. The birds eat them before they ripen. And uh, monkeys, baboons, as I mentioned, will feed on them. African, uh, the, the gray parrots or the, the gray-headed parrots feed on them. Uh, gray luri or the go-away bird and taracos love them as well as barbets. And to find them in the landscape, if we just go over to this page over here, this one, we've seen this before. The most likely place to find it is in the valley bottom next to the rivers the red so that is the easiest place to find them if you find them over here at the base of a slope that's purely where there's some form of seep line indicating moisture and uh, that is essentially where you find them in the granitic soils here in the Sabi sands and further west or east in the basalt soils once again by the rivers okay you never find them up on the slopes up on the rocks and if you do there's an indication that there's some water in the area so I hope that that helps you to understand the, the jackalberry a little bit more. It's probably one of my favorite, favorite trees, but we are going to move on shortly. And while we do so, let's go over to Scott and see if Hukumuri has done anything new. Nope, no changes. And I feel like we could be spending the entire afternoon here with uh, similar outcomes. Um, I just don't think this warthog's going to want to come out the burrow at any course of the day. Again, I must reiterate that something did happen between the drives, and that little chunk of earth there that we can see kind of balancing at the entrance to the burrow was not there this morning, which indicates that there was some kind of a struggle where that was dislodged, possibly when he latched onto the warthog and tried to pull it out. Can't be certain though, maybe it was just the warthog doing some housekeeping with its nose. It kind of shoveled that piece of earth to where we can see it now. But the warthog knows full well, I'm certain, that there is a leopard waiting patiently here for it. Or at least it knew that it was. So, I think we could be waiting until the morning before we see any changes but again only time will tell and I'm hoping that that's not the case. Mrs. Lapwing you wondering if it wouldn't be kind of easier for him or possibly another option for him to go off in search of other prey? Certainly there's lots of other prey waltzing about Juma but you know I guess he knows full well that there's a great opportunity waiting for him here and rather than going off and trying to have to stalk something out in the open, this is possibly, albeit a time consuming, it may be a safer bet for him to just kind of sit and wait patiently because he knows full well that this warthog is going to have to exit at some point. So they're playing a game of patience here and who can outwait the opponent. Very exciting stuff and very, very interesting. I think we're very, very fortunate to be experiencing this unique scene. Well, Peter Viper, you said because Hukumori has already managed to catch a warthog from this very same family of warthogs uh, in kind of January, it was an epic, epic scene and he did an incredible job catching one of the piglets and actually walloped the mother on her nose as she came out to try and defend it and she just went straight back into the hole from whence she had come and you are now therefore rooting for the warthogs that's good I'm rooting for the leopard I always root for the predator simply because the odds are stacked against them and because we very very seldom see them catch their prey so it's something that I like to try and share with you guys as often as physically possible 
But at least we've got some teams. You, any other viewers are welcome to let us know whose team you are on, the cat or the pig. Hello, Yama Bike Mike. You would like to know my thoughts on the fact that because he's not looking incredibly intent at the moment, is there a chance that he could miss the water when it came flying out the burrow? Yes, 100% chance of that happening. There's a, a strong chance it could happen. And I mean, when we came into the scene, yeah, he wasn't where we could see him now. He was on the other side of the burrow. We didn't even know he was here. And had the warthog decided to shoot out at any course of the day when he was far away, and even now, he would have absolutely no chance of catching it. The catch for the warthog is it doesn't know where he is. So the warthog's not willing to take that risk just yet. And I guess if you're the warthog, you'd also kind of want to slowly inch your way out before making the decision to flee. And it's when the warthog is slowly inching its way out that he will be able to hear it and then better position and poise himself ready to pounce. So, yeah, it's a bit of a catch-22 for the warthog. But like I said, if it just kind of took a gamble and went for it, there's a strong chance that the leopard would be left in a cloud of dust. Warthogs are incredibly quick. And I mean, even right now, if that warthog went for it, the leopard, I don't even think, would be able to move before it was out of sight. Well, Linda, Jason, and Clifford, you're all on Team Hukumuri. you wanting him to get his bacon. So that makes four of us. <laughs> Michelle, you're on Team Piggy. And... Won't it be interesting to see who comes out on top again? I mean, the odds are stacked heavily in the warthog's favor, in my opinion. Well, Leopard's got a tough job on his hands to try and be in the right place at the right time to not miss this opportunity. Very good. All righty, well, we're going to stay put right where we are and send you back across to Steve for an update on his adventures. Thank you, Scotty. How is the bacon playing out that side? Is Hukumuri still drooling? <laughs> Marvelous. We get to spend time with that beautiful leopard. Someone said this morning he looks like a gorgeous thug. I think that sums it up perfectly. He is gorgeous, and he does also, at the same time, look like a thug. So, here we have another jackalberry, and it is right next to this small pan of water, and there are what seems to be green pigeons there. Sans, can you get them? Those two birds love jackalberry and figs. He's right next to a little pan. There we go, African green pigeon. Isn't that marvelous? They are the funniest looking bird or pigeon and they are also commonly known as the Tarzan bird because their call sounds like Tarzan. I'm going to try and mimic it. Something like that. <laughs> I'm just moving out the way quickly. We have a vehicle coming into behind us. Good afternoon. African green pigeon. Walla Wanderer would like to know why elephants don't damage jackalberries or if they don't like them. There doesn't seem to be too much nutrition in the branches itself. The wood is very, very hard and the bark is full, 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 full of tannin. You don't actually see too much elephant damage to these trees. Uh, they don't seem to strip the bark. They might stick their tusk in and take off a small little piece, but it doesn't strip like a lot of the other bark we find a lot of other trees. So whether they don't like it at all, you don't see too much 
damage. But elephant will feed on the fruit. They will browse on the fresh leaves. But once they escape the elephants and they get to this height, uh, there's no chance of the elephants damaging them. They are very, very strong and hardy trees. Very, very, very strong ebony wood. Sorry, Faith, is CJ's never seen what? That raptor. <laughs> CJ, this is a pigeon we're looking at. It's not a raptor. It is a pigeon, very similar to a dove, just bigger. Um, and they feed on fruit. They are exclusively fruit eaters. They have a very good relationship with fig trees, jackal berries, and any other fruit-bearing tree. And then they distribute the seeds far and wide. And it's very common to find them in and on jackal berries and fig trees. Very colorful green bird and uh, very, very common in the savanna biome. If you want to find them, just go look in a sycamore fig or a jackal berry and you should find them. And the bird above, I'm sure you're all aware of that one with a long tail. It's called a Birchill's starling. It's one of the glossy starlings. Uh, different from the one in the Mara, I think there's a Huglin's starling with a white eye. This one's got a black eye, very long tail, and very common in the Kruger National Park. Cenac, we do get other pigeon species here. Yeah, we also get the speckled pigeon. Um, but other than that, they're mainly doves. There's not too many other pigeons that I can think of off the top of my head that we find in and around here. So I hope that answers your question. And the doves and pigeons are mainly seed eaters, uh, whereas this guy is exclusively a frugivore. I've never seen them feeding on many seeds. They're always in the trees. They've actually got a very interesting little hopping around in the tree. First time for a lot of you, add that to your list. Um, they're not easy to film. They're often moving in and around these trees, and they just fly out. They are quite camouflaged and disappear into the tree themselves, and the light is not that great. And it's possible that I might even uh, pull them up on my phone to give you a good indication of the colors of these birds because they have the mar most marvelous colored feet and face. If you just give me a moment, I think Sands is getting him quite nicer there. He's busy preening. He's also looking a little bit damp. He's probably been down to the water for a little wallow. For a little bit of a wallow. A, a little bit of a bath. African green pigeon. Well, while we wait for me to find it, I'm... CJ, you think all birds are raptors. Raptors, if you think of the Jurassic Park, the velociraptor, it's a predatory animal uh, or dinosaur. Um, when we talk about raptors out here, raptors are birds of prey, birds that prey on other birds or on other reptiles or mammals or anything like that. So a raptor is a predatory bird, such as a hawk, an eagle, a falcon, kestrel, those sort of things. And we get multitudes of those species in the Kruger Park. Now, let's see how accurate my bird call was before. We want to have a listen. <laughs> Probably one of my favorite calls in the bush. Let's have it to go. Another go. Senzo is loving it. Senzo is loving it. Okay, let me get a picture and put it for you on the screen here. Sens, can you get that one? Let me get a better one. There we go. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? And the picture's taken on a fig tree. This is a primary food source. Let me just, sorry, swipe across. There we go. Look at that. Look at those feet. Look at that face. It is an absolutely gorgeous bird and what they often do is they will ingest the figs and uh, then fly away and then when they defecate they drop the figs in the base of other trees and that's how the figs get distributed. Uh, the rock figs as well, we don't get too many in Juma because we don't have too many rocks but other places I've worked uh, you get those seeds get landed on the rocks of 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 outcrops and then those rocky so those rock figs will grow there um someone sorry faith who was that who asked that question dillip 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 what do they eat on a non-fruiting season well that's the beautiful thing about the savannah that's a beautiful thing about fig trees it's fig trees are fruiting 
all the time. They seem to have gaps where they one will stop and then another one will start, but they're constantly, constantly providing fruit. There doesn't seem to be much of a time period when they're not. And a jackalberry can have fruit throughout the year. It takes a very long time. It takes almost a year for their fruit to ripen, and these birds will feed on, on the unripe fruit as well. So there is always fruit out here. That's how birds are able to survive, how a lot of animals are able to survive out here. And it, yeah, fig trees, we don't get too many sycamore figs here, but there are a few, and hopefully we can find one. So we're going to move on. We're on our way down to Chitwa Dam. Chitwa Dam. We're going to go over to Taylor and see what she has in store for you, and we'll catch up with you very shortly. Well, I'm about to be unplugged. So it's very warm today, and David had a great idea. He said, why don't we come and see if we can find the foam nest frogs that Scotty had around here the other day. But sadly, I can't see any just yet. But that's okay, because there's lots of other interesting things to talk about over here. So obviously, we've got lots of trees. There's the jackalberry over there, youngster. And then, I'm trying to see if there's any more how many trees they're actually using. I'll tell you what I'm counting. One, two, three, four. Looks like they're using four trees, the various animals that would come down and utilize this mud wallow just in front of the car. I've actually had a really cool sighting once of Karula drinking from here, but that was quite some time ago, but I'll never forget it, coming around the corner, having birds alarming it and uh, giving away her presence, which was great for us. So the animals will come down and have a mud wallow, so rhinos, buffalo, warthog, and of course elephants, anything else that wants to have a bit of a swim. And then they'll come up to a tree like this, and this looks like it's been used quite heavily because not only is the entire tree sort of basted with mud, but also the ground below it is um, quite damaged. There's not much grass growing underneath here, and I don't think it's because there's a bit of shade because I think this will get quite a bit of sun. These trees don't have a massive canopy on them. So I think it's constantly from animals walking on here and utilizing um, these trees to sort of scratch themselves to remove ticks. Let's see if we can find anything. There's lots of little ants crawling around, but if we look very carefully, then sometimes you can actually find the ticks that have suffocated and then been sort of uh, dislodged on this tree, which is always quite nice to see. No. Sadly, it doesn't look like any ticks. Nothing just yet. Oh, cool. Hang on. Do you know what I have found, David? Can you see this tiny little plant down here? I'll try to bring it up a bit. So at the base of this tree, this is quite nice. Something that I haven't seen for a while is wild asparagus, in fact. So it's sort of very... Very, very tiny, thin leaves, but um, quite cl uh, closely packed together. And they normally have little thorns on their stem. And this is a great water source. So if you're out here and you're needing to find... Oh, I found a worm. Oh, lots of them. Oh, wow. There's lots and lots of little caterpillars. David, let me try to find the biggest one for you. So you can actually dig the roots out. They're legumes, of course, and you can eat them. You can also get water from them. Can you see that tiny little worm on there? It might be far away. But I don't know what, what species of caterpillar this is, but there are so many of them covering this wild asparagus. So we'll have to have a look. Gee, I've got my butterfly book here, so that would be nice. So throughout the entire drive, I'll start paging through. I'm not actually sure um, what species of butterfly, or what moth species feeds on uh, wild asparagus, but I'm pretty sure it should be in one of the books that I have. So that would be quite nice to see. That's just the only little asparagus plant. And there were no other little caterpillars anywhere else around you. Not on the grasses surrounding it. Not up on any of the leaves that I can see. But definitely down on, uh, on that asparagus. It's amazing what you can see when you just jump out of the car and you have a look. That's why we love bushwalks so much. I'm just going to go back. Sadly, no frogs. We'll get them next time, though. I'm going to concentrate. We've got to go through a tight gap, Darby. I'm so sorry. Just watch those thorns. South African biting trees. Cool. Well, that's quite nice. I'm going to get my books out now and uh, have a little look to try and figure out what caterpillar was um, feasting on the wild asparagus. Steve, however, has got another little creature that also likes to eat leaves and grass. We have found our own leopard, ladies and gentlemen. I decided to get out the car and come and say hello. One of the fastest animals on the planet. It took me quite a while to catch up. It moved so quickly. I had to run to catch up 
but we caught up eventually and this beautiful lip tortoise I've counted the rings on the scoots it's about 16 17 the little ups and down ridges in the scoots the scoots are the scoot essentially is this shell on the top which is constantly growing through the life of the tortoise and the rings themselves actually show the sea they show the seasons of growth and you can see like the rings of a tree a tree grows in the summer it gets more moisture grows more in winter doesn't grow as much so you can kind of see that in the growth of these animals as well and you can age them by that I believe the up and down ridges you count them and you get the years so about 16 17 years of age but he probably gets quite a bit bigger than this just loping around as we know this is one of the Uncle Huma's favorite toys a little bit big I think there we go his heads popped out he's loving the little grass and vegetation and uh, he's not far from Chitwa Dam in in my uh, perspective but for his perspective Chitwa Dam is a very long way away so he's enjoying the green that's been provided by all the grass and by the rain and we can hear lightning in the background and there is rain in the air Cnac, how many ooh, how many tortoise species do we have in the biome? Mm, with the specs hinged, got the leopard tortoise. I'm stumped. I might need to check my book and see how many tortoise species. There's two most common that we see, the specs hinged and the, 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 the leopard tortoise. So I apologize if anything's breaking up. There he goes. He's on the move. She's on the move. Feeding on everything nutritious and green quite relaxed quite pretty quite beautiful very very special to be able to see these guys on foot um, I'm not going to it is a tortoise <laughs> we're going to leave it to its wanderings sorry about the breakup folks we're going to leave the tortoise to its wanderings and we're going to head on down to the dam where I think there might be some elephant. Coast Cider asks about a white flower. I did not see the flower. We have a vehicle joining us on the left here. Apologies. I don't see a flower. I saw some dung there. No flower. Tortoise. Just have a vehicle joining us. I think they want to also see the leopard tortoise. Sorry, I'm not sure what flower you were talking about there. Okay, well, we're going to move on down to the dam, and who knows what we might see there. I think I might have seen an elephant in the distance before we got distracted by that beautiful Chelonian. And while we do, we're going to go over to Scott for an update with Mr. What's his name again? Hukumuri. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sometimes I'll also forget his name, and I'm wishing Steve all the best luck when he does arrive at that water hole. It very often does provide the goods for us, um, even if it's not necessarily a big cat. There's often so much happening there, so good prospects for him as he approaches the dam. Nothing really has changed here. If anything, things have kind of calmed down to a snooze. And that's what Tingana's up to now. He's got himself very, very comfortable. Oh, not Tingana, Hukumuri, rather. He's got himself very, very comfortable up on this termite mound. And it will be very, very interesting to see how this all unfolds. But time will only tell. Puma, you've brought up a great point, and it's something that I was thinking about a little bit earlier. Because he has come from so far away, about 100 kilometers or so, roughly 60 miles, he is bringing in fresh genes into the area. So even though there might be some initial heartbreak as he may murder a few cubs that are not his, the kind of bigger picture is a good one, because new blood in the gene pool is only going to help solidify the future for the leopards here of the Sabi Sands. And we're very fortunate, Puma, to be in this massive ecosystem where animals can wander far and wide and manage their gene pools themselves. 
Uh, quite a few areas, uh, in, especially in South Africa, the smaller fenced reserves require us as humans to kind of play Mother Nature. Not that there's anything wrong with that, you know. I'd rather us have to interfere in those smaller reserves and still have sanctuaries for wild animals than not have them at all. But, you know, in an ideal world, I guess, which is what we should all be striving towards, a large ecosystem where we don't have to interfere is first prize. I can hear thunder beginning to rumble to the north of us. So it sounds like possible rainy weather is going to be making its way towards us. Let's try and show you where the noise is coming from. It actually looks like a bank of rain that we're looking at over there. I can't be certain, but could be rain falling out to the north, possibly out there as well. Rob, you'd like to know if there's any chance of uh, the Hukumuri male coming across another male leopard that we know very well, sadly one that we haven't seen very often. Um, his name is Quarantine. And yes, I mean, it could happen. I wouldn't say it's hugely likely at this point in time. He's still got quite a way to go uh, further east from where he is now. He's slowly establishing uh, himself on Juma kind of from west to east. Um, and it's going to still be quite a while, I think, until he extends his territory that far to come across quarantine. But it certainly could well happen. It'll just be in, in the future, how far into the future. It's impossible to say. Again, who knows, as quarantine gets bigger and stronger, he could start pushing back to the west and spending more time towards us. Um, it is a possibility. There's no two ways about that. Very, very good. Now, I've got a feeling we're going to be coming back here tomorrow morning. <laughs> but happy to wait here for the time being. And again, I must reiterate that something went down in between the drives, and there's nothing to say that something may not happen at any moment, even though it doesn't seem like it, and even though my gut feeling tells me it won't. Very often, we get surprised out here. So be ready for anything. Be ready for a quick link getting race raced back to us here. For now, though, we are going to send you across to Taylor. Well, something quite interesting has happened here. We think, or well, that Impala just gave an alarm call, and we think that these three have come looking for their friend, friend Frank. What's going on? Because they're basically where Tundi had the big Impala ram kill yesterday. But now they've started alarming. We're going to try and make this funny, but now it seems a bit more serious than that. What have you heard? What have you smelt? What have you seen? I don't think he quite knows what's going on. It's like he feels like that something has happened here. What am I missing? No one else is alarming, though. The other two are on high alert. And as one runs, the other one runs too. And I don't think they're quite ratting. Are you alarming at us? Surely not. We've been here the entire time and you've been quiet. But what a beautiful animal. Oh, can you hear the thunder now? That is a mean storm on its way. Uh, Nina, you're wondering if it is difficult for... Oh, sorry, no, I didn't hear that. There's something else making a noise here. I wonder if this leopard cub is still around. I'm pretty sure I heard a, I'm so sorry, Faith, can I have that whole thing again? Like a, a, I heard a weird sound that didn't sound like the Impala just before they started alarming. There we go. Sorry, Nina. Is it easy for predators to hunt during thunderstorms? It's easy, yeah, especially when it is quite light because you'll have the rumbling of the thunder, which we just heard. The rain as well makes for a great cover. Remember, rain is quite noisy. So it will hide their, any sounds that they're making. They might be able to move a bit quicker. And we saw that a lot in the Mara, where the lions would take opportunity uh, when a storm would come round, and they'd often successfully take down their prey too. So I feel like in the Mara, when there was a thunderstorm, 
the Predators definitely had a better chance, and I, I couldn't see why it would be any different here in the Sabi Sand either. So this is exactly where Tandy was. So maybe they can smell it, because where that ram that was doing all the alarming is, that's where Tandy was laying when we left her last night. So maybe it's a scent, and they're just unsure. Maybe they think that there's a leopard nearby, and they're just being overly cautious. Because he's looking towards us. I think that's what it is. I think that he's actually smelled. But I did hear a strange sound. Very fit, these three Impala, though, especially this one. Lovely thick neck. All the muscles are tensed at the moment, though, which is kind of showing them off. And Paula, you said that he's so majestic looking. He d is indeed much smaller than the Impala and the Mara. And the reason for that is just because there's food all year round. They never stop mating, so there's naturally more testosterone uh, being pumped through their bodies so they are able to get larger I mean their horns are much much bigger the splay is much wider even just the size of their body is that thunder again now that there's thunder we've got to be careful for lightning so what we will do is we probably won't hang around in this area I think we might try and avoid the storm completely as most of you know, we've got big antennas sticking out of the vehicles. Rain is okay, but lightning is not our friend, I'm afraid. And it's just coming in from the south. So what we will do is I think we'll head up towards Bufflesook Dam, have a little look around there, and then start making our way north to try and evade the storm. And hopefully Steve doesn't get caught into it because he's further south than I am. And that's who I'm sending you to next. Thanks, Taylor. I hope those alarm calls become fruitful for you there. It'd be nice to have a, another leopard this afternoon, wouldn't it? I think the viewers at home are, are wondering, where are all the leopards in Juma? <laughs> they're around, folks. I can guarantee you they're around. But the, the storm seems to be passing us by here on the right-hand side. Look, it's, it's ominous in the, in the sky. There's some lightning calling, but uh, it's not too bad. Just wanna, we're at Chitra Dam now itself. I'd like to have a look at this, this big tree here, Sins, with all the buffalo weaver nests, and have a look at that accumulation of barn swallows in there. Barn swallows have come all the way from Europe, known as European swallows, to the Europeans and to the South Africans, known as barn swallows. They are going to be heading back soon let me just double check when they'll be heading all the way back to the north um, so soon yeah February to March so generally what happens when you find them accumulating in these large flocks like this I mean there must be more than 30 40 of them there is um, and I don't know how it works I think it's got to do with the direction of the wind but what they generally say oh there's a gymnogene just land on the right there sends right of the base of the tree on the buffalo weaver's nest bottom right sends that last nest so there's an African harrier hawk folks has just landed on a nest there and they are raiding specialists they are very good at this kind of work and I know I was busy talking about the barn swallows they've all moved off in haste away from the raptor that's just landed so um, those of you who want to know what raptors are, this is a classic example of a predatory bird. And this one is specialized in that it raids nests. Look at those long legs. And it, that is on a buffalo weaver nest, which is a little communal nest. There could be more than one bird in there. Could be some chicks. Could be some, could be some eggs. Wow. Crafty Stash, what an interesting name. You'd like to know why bird names have changed. Now, essentially what happened is that there needed to be some sort of uh, worldwide consensus. Uh, we had lots of Europeans coming to South Africa to bird. And for example, I'll give you a bird that was called the Huglin's Robin, uh, but the scientific name was something different. Well, was the scientific names are generally the same, but it's the common names that change. But you had Europeans coming to South Africa to bird, and they were getting birds that people were saying were Huglin's Robin. And in fact, they knew it as a white-browed Robin chat. So it actually was already classified by them and ticked by them. So there were a lot of birds that were misnamed 
Um, a lot of birds through genetic research as well have been reclassified. For example, the gray go away bird has been changed to match that of its other African counterparts because it is not a Taraco anymore. And the Taracos were all classified as luries, but there are other luries elsewhere. So they've taken the Taraco because the Taracos have got red on the wing and also green, which are two pigments called Tyrosin and Turaco Verdin, hence the name Turaco. So a lot of it might be to sell more books. Uh, a lot of it's also to sort of to standardize the birding across the world because birding is the number one biggest growing sport and hobby in the world. There are a lot of people who are into it. There's a lot of professionals, a lot of experts, and they just wanted to sort of mix them all together because our birds and the Kenyan birds were very differently classified and Europeans really wanted us to sort of put them in an order that we could call them something quite similar. So that is one of the major reasons. There might be a few others, maybe a genetic variation that they realize it's not actually that and they've changed it again. But then also there's huge publishing costs and rights that come out of, out of a new book. Uh, we all like to have new books. I've had the same book for many, many years, uh, hence I miss some of the new names but that gymnogene is very busy in that nest there Cenac, you are very busy today sir and yes we do have lots of native species of swallows martins and swifts and i will be able to show you shortly on my phone how many we have in fact but let's have a look at this gymnogene he's really working in there there's a chamber there that the buffalo weavers have where they roost. They roost in here as well. Potentially uh, the bird itself has heard that there are maybe chicks in there. Um, because we've had quite a good season and the rains, it's possible the buffalo weavers have nested again or roosted again. And with those long piercing legs, it's able to stick them deep into that nest and pry out whatever they want. But I'm very surprised, excuse me, that there's no attention from any buffalo weavers trying to bombard it and chase it away. Is that a buffalo weaver there? Yeah. There's a buff. No, that's a starling. I'm not sure. Can you see that bird above, Sen? It's just a little bit further up. There's a few of them now. Yes, those are buffalo weavers. Yeah, the buffalo weavers are just above them. They're watching quite intently. Here we go. Can you see that one on the left? The forktail drongo is alarming because they are the honey badgers of the sky. They are scared of nothing. Oh, no, that is not. It is a red-billed red -billed buffalo weaver. They are very, very active now, and they are quite upset that that gymnogene or African harry hawk is busy at their nest, and they will bomb it and chase it and try and get it to move away. There he is. There is some wonderful wind coming in, folks. Can you hear the lightning? The wind is picking up. I don't see the rain too close by, but if you look over to our right-hand side, there is an enormous storm over there, which is coming in. Look how beautiful that is. We might need to turn tail and head back for camp shortly. The wind is in our favor, but how marvelous is that? absolutely sensational the wind has picked up the prelude to the storm is coming it is possible that we might need to turn around and start heading back i'm going to close my eyes for the dust that is coming behind us yes indeed i think we might need to go we're going to go to taylor she's back online look at the dust going over the dam this is beautiful but we have a lot of expensive equipment we will need to get back to camp and potentially put on our roof i think we might miss this storm but we need to be careful as uh, we don't want to take chances with equipment just because of a little bit of rain. So on we go and we're going to go over to Taylor and we'll catch up with you shortly. We're doing exactly the same thing. Steve, I'm having to hold on to my hat now because it's so windy that it feels like it's going to blow it off even though it's really tight on my head. Uh, I can see some rain. I wonder if Scott's getting rained on because it looks like it's over back towards him. That's not what I'm worried about at the moment. The thing that I'm worried about most, oh my goodness, is the lightning. That for me is the biggest problem at the moment. I also want to avoid the, oh, I'm going to lose my head. I also do want to avoid the rain. I don't want to get stuck in it. Like Steve said, there's some very expensive equipment on board. But for the moment, I just don't want Darby and I to get electrocuted. So I've picked up the pace a substantial amount, as you can see now. 
and we're going to go back down, jump onto Central, I think. We're just on Quarry Pan Road, so we'll go down in Yala Road North, get onto Central, and then start heading back towards towards camp. Here comes a drizzle, and it's very windy, so hopefully it doesn't stay around for too long. So I think we're going to get caught in it big time. Just hear all the birds chirping trying to get out of it as well probably trying to get down and into some cover i apologize i'm not looking back at all of you i need to just um concentrate and get back as quick as we can because i think we're in the thick of the storm at the moment also we're having some equipment failure as you can see i'm going to send you across to see while we sort ourselves out Thanks, Taylor. Sorry I'm not looking at the camera, folks. I'm just, we're covering up the most expensive parts on the vehicle. Um, not Senzo. He is probably the most expensive part, but he doesn't need covering. We are both waterproof, but the equipment we have on board is, can be quite sensitive. So we have just got the cover on the front, we've got the cover on the monitor, and Senzo is just busy putting the covers in and around the camera itself, because that storm, it's absolutely everywhere at the moment and it could hit us in a big stream the lightning is off that side there's thunder on this side the swallows are going absolutely nuts at the moment cnac wanted to know about swallows swifts and martins now if sends i'm sorry but if you could help me here here we have one page of swallows so there we can see um the barn swallow white throat to swallow did you see that lightning i saw it sorry angola swallow not in south africa white-tailed and pearl-breasted and then that is just one page and then i go again there's more swallows the mosque swallow red rumped red-breasted lesser striped greater striped and then the most endangered of them all the blue swallow then one more page we get some martins or oh, there's a cliff swallow rock martin a uh, white-headed sawwing, house martin, black sawwing, eastern sawwing, and that's it's that's it for the swallows. So there's some more martins. If I go back, sand martin, brown-throated, banded martin, mascarine, and grey rumped. That is it for the swallows and martins. And if I go into swifts, we have got a number of swift species as well. If I just open the page, bird family, there we go. We've got the scarce swift, which I have never seen, the alpine swift, mottled swift, common swift, pallid and African black, and then a whole other page here. Horace swift, uh, white rumped, Bradfields, which I haven't seen, African palm, mottled spinetail and bomb spinetail, two quite rare species that you find up in the north of the Kruger. I have seen both of those two, quite special. They fly like bats. And uh, that is it for martins and swallows. Now, I was talking briefly before about the, the gray go-away bird being changed from a lurie into a go-away bird and all the taracos being changed, all the luries into, into taracos. And if, Sens, if you can just zoom in on a little bit for me here, have a look at the common denominator. If you just get the whole screen in there, that's about right. What is the common denominator between all of those birds that the gray go-away bird does not have? And the answer is the green pigment, which is called Turocco Verdin, which is the only true green pigment in nature. And then the red, which is called Tyrosin, which is also derived from the iron and the diets of these birds. And so both of those two pigments, which are very common in those species and completely lacking in the go-away bird, is where they've been named Turocco. So that is a very interesting, a good reason for renaming birds. So I hope that answers that question from before. But as we drive, Senzo's going to keep the camera on me. We're going to drive him a little bit slowly. He's going to put uh, this hefty canvas on the back to cover all our batteries and monitors and I'm going to slowly start driving because <coughs> this storm folks is imminent and I think we might get wet but it's okay I'm going to hide my phone under there because okay so ladies and gentlemen you are only with me at the moment because Taylor and Scott have powered down because of the storm we are driving with this massive aerial on the back which is like a lightning conductor. Um, I'm pretty sure with the tires that we should be okay. But um, here comes here comes the rain, ladies and gentlemen. Sens, are you good? 
Let's put on. We're just going to stop the car. Sensor's going to put on the official, actual cover for, for the the camera. All of that is good. Ah, uh, it's okay. We we're not getting that wet, but Sensor and I just need to make sure that this is all nicely covered. We can't. We don't want the camera to get wet. It's not very very hard rain, but it's good to be prepared in case it torrentially downpours. <laughs> Bianca, get, sorry, I'm a what? Sorry, sorry, Faith. Fearless, I'm fearless. Wow! I don't know if you saw that, folks. That was an enormous bolt of lightning directly in front of us. So that is where Scott and Taylor are over there somewhere. And if we go towards that, we might need to power down ourselves and take a short break purely because, listen to that, it is coming. We need this. Okay, Faith is... Faith is giving us the go-ahead. We're going to shut down for a little bit due to the storm. We'll be back live with you in a little while. We're going to go over to our tech loop. Have a fantastic afternoon for now, and we'll be back with you when we can.
We are back and the storm for now seems to have passed. It was quite a deluge. Taylor just made it back in time. Seb and I were home safely, but Steve was not so lucky and he got drenched. So I'm not too sure what he's going to be up to now. But we're heading back towards the Hukumuri male leopard. As some of you may know, there's some exciting news regarding a leopard that was spotted on the dam cam. It sounds like it could be a young male called Tumba. And I just thought I'd stop here to show you the beautiful, beautiful scene out to the west. Is that not spectacular? The air is crisp and clean now after that rain has moved through and a beautiful glow off to the west. Now as much as I'd like to stay here and think about happy memories, we're not going to do that. We're going to head straight back towards the Hukumuri male who we left perched up on a termite mine and it's going to be interesting to see whether he's still there. I think it was Kylie who asked what would happen if a storm came in. Would he just stay there and weather it or would he move off and time will tell. Hope you're still watching Kylie and I hope it was Kylie that actually asked that question a bit earlier. Cool. We're only about five minutes away. I think Taylor's just about to head out. We had to get our rain roofs on and just make sure we are ready in case there's another deluge. David, you'd like to know how much rain fell? Ugh. I mean... It was literally five minutes of, of decent downpour, but yeah, not much rain to be honest. Um, better than nothing, of course, but I mean, I wouldn't even be able to hazard. Maybe one mil of rain fell. So I was about to say I wasn't going to hazard a guess, but I, I did. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, thank you to all of you who are appreciating our efforts to come back out after the storm and it's a great pleasure and it's very exciting to be able to head out i think after the rain has fallen everything's crisp and clean maybe some serpents will start slithering about that'll be wonderful if we get to see some snakes and snakes do tend to like to move after there has been rain so good prospects for a snake maybe at some point in the evening Alrighty. Uh, Mr. T, you would, ask, you would like to know if we can show you some lions. Uh, yes, we certainly can. Um, just not today. <laughs> There's no lions on our property today, Mr. T. The pride that usually spends time with us are fur further north of... Have I just driven past where I'm supposed to go? I have. Um, I'm not thinking very clearly, am I? Um, let's turn around here. Uh, so yeah, Mr. T, sadly, our local uh, kind of resident pride is not on our property. Um, we cannot drive wherever we like. There are road boundaries which limit us to certain areas of the Sabi Sands Reserve. So the animals can go and do what they like. It's just that we can't. And that's merely to make sure that any one area where people on safari is not too congested which is a great thing, but it does mean there are periods where there simply are no lions around. But fear not, Mr. T. A leopard will be a wonderful animal to spend some time with. And I guess there's not just one, but two leopards on the cards. Okay, one of which Taylor's going to look for right now. Hopefully it won't take long for her to find it. And she would like you guys to hop on board and join her in her search. Whoops, obviously some small issue with Taylor's audio there, but fear not, it'll be rectified shortly, I'm fairly sure of that. And we've just got about a minute or two until we negotiate a little bit of off-roading, which will lead us to where we left this big male leopard who's been perched and poised on a termite mound waiting for some warthogs to come out of it. He's been there since this morning, if any of you have just jumped on board with us. So, he is, he's been in the spot now for almost 12 hours. Um, how cool is that? 
Jeez, I'm doing a terrible job concentrating today. What is wrong with you, Scott? Get with the program, buddy. <laughs> so busy chatting to you guys, I'm not concentrating about where I'm going. Well, Taylor's got quite a tricky job on her hands. She's not going to, it's going to be difficult to see any tracks unless the leopards walk through some muddy areas. But she is snooping about and I hope she gets lucky. Sounds like there might be another vehicle who's out there helping her search. So that's good news. Noriko. You'd like to know if elephants like the rain, and yes, they love it. Cools them off, provides their vegetation with much needed moisture so that it grows and becomes tasty. And yes, as a general rule, as far as I'm concerned, elephants do not mind the rain at all. Okay. So I've just got visual of the turnout mound. We're not far away now. And no visual of the leopard just yet. Where could he be? Huh. When we first came onto this... Oh, that's a stump. Justin, you'd like to know what I think my career would be if I wasn't a guide. And good question. Um, I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a clue. Um, I've always wanted to be a guide from a young age. Um, so it was always kind of the plan. And I left the bush for a short period after I had guided for three years at the same camp. I actually got a little bit burnt out and I thought that I'd done my time um, and I moved back to the city and worked for a property auction house of all things. That only lasted for a few months because our boss got caught for being involved in some fraudulent activities, <laughs> which, you know, was a blessing in disguise because um, I was enjoying the job, the money was really good. Um, and. It was nice to be back in the city and have a bit of normality in my life. Oh, sorry, another stump. Um, and after the company got closed down, I was kind of at a bit of a loose end. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, and one of my friends from high school who lives in Kenya actually called me then and he heard that I was unemployed and needed some help privately guiding some safaris up in Kenya. So I went up there, what was planned to be only for a month, and I ended up spending a year there before I came home for a two-week holiday, and then I spent another year there before coming back for another holiday, which I planned to spend two months back in South Africa. And it was during that period of time when I thought I was going to be heading back to Kenya that I heard about Wild Earth and Safari Live, and here I am today. Okay, well, there is no immediate sign of this leopard. Now, because we've got the roof on, it makes filming a little bit tricky for Seb to show you everything that's going on, but we'll just have to take my word for it that the termite mine is just on our left. We've got one of the flaps down just to try and prevent too much rain coming in. In this long grass, I must just drive very carefully. He could be nearby. I don't want to startle him unnecessarily. Okay, very good. Well, Taylor's managed to rectify her audio issues, so why don't we send her, send you back to her? Right, this time, hopefully, you can hear me. We are drenched and soaked 
and not cold yet but I suspect that that chill is going to come through in a minute my goodness what a hectic storm so hectic I didn't even see Tumb I could barely see I had my sunglasses on trying to get back and out of the lightning so we weren't run, really running away from the rain water doesn't bother me too much I quite like it in fact however I'm petrified of being struck by lightning it's one of my fears so now we're trying to find Tumba I don't know where he's gone but Taxon I don't know if you may have seen if you're watching on the dam cam uh, myself and Taxon met up we had a quick chat he's got obviously got Fanotti on his car who's his tracker and uh, can see the tracks a lot better than we can positioned right in front of the vehicle so he's gonna go in the direction where you all said that he went towards Mbubu Road and um, and then of course he's gonna let us know if he does see anything let me just check this the game drive radio is going and we've gone up Gauri Cutler. Yeah. Going back towards the boundary. To Buffalo's Hook boundary. And then we'll go I don't think we're gonna go on the road. I think we're gonna go on the fire break back around and see if we can see anything. Couldn't see any tracks though. So if he was moving while pouring with rain, that would expect his tracks would have been covered by the rain. Uh, however, if it had stopped slightly, we should have seen his tracks quite nicely, but we couldn't see any. So we're just having a little a scratch around. Let's see what else is happening. But there's still a bit of lightning lingering. I don't know if we're going to get another pour of rain coming in that uh, direction. But let's go back across to Scott. Sorry guys, it seems like Taylor's signal is a bit shaky there, but welcome back on board with me and Seb. Um, there's no immediate sign of him uh, where we left him. He could be lying up in the grass. Um, it's very thick. But I'm inclined to think that he may have actually moved off. I don't know why, again, just a gut feeling. So I'm going to do a big loop. Uh, continuing on in the direction that he was moving in this morning before he came to this termite mound where he's been all day so I'll do a big loop in that direction if we have no further sign of him then I may return back to the mound again just checking the road carefully for any tracks but interestingly the kind of opposite happens when rain falls to what you think because you would think all the kind of ground becomes soft and muddy and easy to see tracks in, but it's not necessarily the case. Like on this road where we're driving now, it's actually kind of solidified all the little dusty particles that were creating a fine layer of dust on the top, which receives a track quite well, and um, therefore it obviously makes the tracking harder. There are obviously some really soft, muddy portions of certain roads that you can see tracks in, but for the most part it's actually more difficult to track after the rain believe it or not oh i've just seen the cutest little frog gonna, let me see if i can find it one second you're not going to be able to see me How cute is this little thing? It's called a bushveld rain frog. And as you can tell, it's absolutely tiny. How cool. And just like I said, snakes may come out after the rain. These bushveld rain frogs are another animal that like to come out after the rain. And they're an interesting little animal because they waddle. They don't jump, so there's no risk of it jumping off my hand here. Yeah? They don't have that ability. They're little waddling frogs. Cool. I don't want to keep it from its business for too long. I just thought I'd like to show you. So I'm going to plop it back on the ground where I found it. Have a nice day. Okay. Time to find the leopard. And I'm glad a lot of you guys thought that little critter was very cute. It certainly is one of the 
cutest amphibians out there, in my opinion. And even though I'm in love with the foam nest frogs, as some of you may know, the bushveld rain frogs are also very cute. Not as sexy as the as the foam nest frog, in my opinion. Though different genres. One's cute, one's sexy. Okay. Now. We are going to find this leopard walking down the road. His general direction of movement was this way this morning, so if he continued on, then this is where we may find him. If not him, we may find some sign of him moving down here at least. I'm also checking quite carefully on any termite mounds as we go along. And just dangling my head over the side just to make sure we don't get lucky with any tracks. Good stuff. Well, we're going to keep investigating this area for any further signs and send you across to poor old Steve, who a little bit earlier was quite soaked. I hope he's got a change of clothes. <laughs> quite soaked is another term for a drowned rat. Senzo and I made it back from Chitwa. Um, we managed to get back in time to, uh, we've now got the roof on, and sorry for the delay, delay folks, we probably should have started the show with the roof, I do humbly apologize for that, but uh, we are back down south, uh, we'll see what we can see, we do have a change of clothes, we had some incredible lightning, and probably one of the biggest downpours of rain I've experienced in some time, at one point Sens and I actually had to pull over, because I couldn't see, and guess what tree we pulled underneath? Jackalberry, that exact same Jackalberry ended up being our savior for a few moments, which was marvelous. Helped us just to get the stinging rain out of the eyes. I've even damaged my microphone in the hat, had to replace that. So that took another couple of minutes. So do apologize for the delay, but we are back out and the rain seems to have passed, but we do have the roof on and we are ready to show you some wonderful things. Wonderful things. What's that sense? <laughs> Senzo had to go into his cage. He was actually hiding under the sheets at one point. Francis wonders if we collect the rain here. Unfortunately, we don't. We should. We should, but the rainfall is not, not enough, and it's not all the time. So if we collected rainfall, it would only last for the summer months, and then it would be gone. But I still believe we should capture everything we have. Uh, it's something we could put forward. We do need some rain uh, covers, or sorry, some rainwater tanks. Collect all the rainwater off the roofs. I think that would be ideal, especially if we start growing a small veggie garden, some herbs. We wonderful if we could collect some water. Um, we don't have the hugest amount of roof area, but it's still it is better than nothing. <coughs> Apologies for that. The birds, though, ladies and gentlemen, are absolutely loving it. After some rain like this, the dust has settled. They've managed to get themselves nice and wet, and they're all sitting in their trees, preening themselves, cleaning themselves, getting all those ablutions done before the evening. And remember, it was a very warm day, so a huge amount of respite for the animals after such a warm afternoon. And uh, it is going to be quite a nice, cool evening. The freshness, I wish you could smell it. There's nothing quite like the smell of the African bush after a thunderstorm. And what we saw on the way back, I had many of these. I apologize if the, bo the bar is in the way, but these little specks, hinged tortoises, always disappearing, were in the road and were drinking the puddles of water. So that is saves them a lot of time. Remember we were with that, uh, uh, that leopard tortoise. He was quite far from the dam. So after some rain, these tortoises will drink the water off puddles, off of the leaves themselves, and they'll obviously be able to sustain themselves without having to go a long distance to drink. So from me, we're going to go over to Taylor, and uh, she's going to be welcoming our school for the afternoon, and we'll be back with you shortly. <coughs> hello, hello, everybody from a Tomahawk school. It's very nice to have you with me today my name is Taylor and on camera with me is David now 
for those of you who have never joined us on a safari before, it's very exciting. And you can actually ask us questions because this is a live safari. It's happening right now in South Africa. So all you have to do is ask your teacher some questions. And what David and I are doing this afternoon is, firstly, we got so soaked. The rains just came pouring down over the top of us. We had to put our roof on and we didn't even get to change our clothes. We're still in our wet clothes, but we'll be okay. And now, how exciting is this? The rain has brought out all sorts of animals. I've been seeing lots of tortoises. Hopefully we'll see some more. Maybe we see a snake. I'm also looking for a leopard. How nice would that be? Right, let's have a little look here and see what we can, can have a look for. Mm, there goes a the little birdie. I heard some, actually some birds alarming in the distance, making that sound that you might be able to hear a little bit. And normally when they make that sound, either it's because of us giving them a fright or sometimes they see a predator, like a leopard, and then they will alarm call. So they'll basically be screaming, they're going, ah, help, help, help. Now, all of you from Tomahawk School, you're wondering what is the name of the park? So we are in an area called the Sabi Sand Viltain. So it's a private area. You can't just come on safari here all by yourself. You've actually got to come on safari and stay at one of the lodges in order to come here. Um, but we're very close to the Kruger National Park, which maybe some of you have heard before. It's a very famous safari destination and it's a huge area. So basically the Greater Kruger, which uh, the Sabi Sands is also included in, is just over 8 million acres. It's huge. It's massive. You can just drive and drive and drive for days. So now I think I'm going to have to put some lights on. So hopefully these lights that I just put on now are going to help me with seeing the footprints of this leopard. Because he's around here somewhere. He was just seen, but then we had to go home because the lightning was too bad. We didn't want to get struck by lightning. It can be a little bit dangerous. And as most of you know, you mustn't hide under trees if there is lots and lots of lightning. So I'm going to do a combination of driving, sitting and listening to see if I can maybe hear if someone is telling me where the leopard is walking, maybe a squirrel or a bird, or even an impala, which is an antelope alarming. Scott is also searching for a leopard and he had one a little bit earlier. Yes, we certainly are looking for a leopard just like Taylor. My name's Scott and I'm teamed up with Seb on camera. Now, we had to rush back to camp as I'm sure Taylor told you because we had a big downpour of rain and between then and heading back out, this male leopard that we're looking for has moved away from the area where we had seen him this morning. And it was very interesting because he led us to the home of some warthogs and if you don't know what a warthog is it's like an African pig really and they gray in color and they live in burrows under the ground and the leopards are very clever and they know that if they wait there early in the morning they've got a chance of catching a warthog when they come running out of the burrow and the leopard had been very very patient it had waited there the entire day we left it, it's, it, found, it, it found the warthog's home at 6 o'clock this morning. It's now 6.30 in the evening. So it nearly stayed in the same spot for 12 full hours waiting patiently for a meal. But he seems to have moved off. He may still be lying in the long grass in the general area where we left him. We did go and look there earlier, but there was no sign. So we'll continue to go back there. Maybe he's moved position to somewhere where we can see him. Now... I get lonely very easy everyone, so please ask as many questions as you can, otherwise I'm going to get sad. So anything that comes to mind, anything you want to know about coming to Africa or being on safari or the animals here? Oh well Robert, you've just mentioned that you would love to be doing some of the off-roading, just like we're doing now, and it is lots of fun. But quite tricky at this time of the year because the grass, as you can see, is so long that we can't see any hidden tree stumps or holes. So it can be a little bit tricky, but it certainly is a good challenge and it's very exciting following the animals off the roads. 
we're quite lucky because the vehicle that we use is very short it's not nearly as long as the other regular safari vehicles which have got lots of tourists on the back so that allows us to wiggle through the bush a little bit more easily than the regular safari vehicles wonderful stuff well we are hopefully going to have a good update for you soon with this leopard and while we continue our search we're going to send you across to steve to see what he's getting up to Good afternoon boys and girls. Welcome to my side of the show. My name is Steve Falkenbridge and I'm joined by the very talented Senzo Mkize on the camera and uh, we got caught in a very strong thunderstorm just now. The lightning was bellowing. Senzo was hiding under the covers of the back here. It was quite a frightening experience. So we rushed all the way back to camp and we got ourselves changed and a roof on the car and now we're headed back out to see what wonders we can find in the African bush after this very nice downpour of rain. It is really, really cool. And the wind has changed. It's very strong wind. Hello, Mrs. Nicholson. Welcome to the show. Um, my favorite animal in the savanna biome would be undoubtedly the honey badger. Now, I will probably have to show you a picture of the honey badger because you might not have seen it. Tucked all of my books away because of the weather. Honey badger is probably... Sorry about my audio. Is it back again? Sorry about the audio, folks. Let me just find. The honey badger is my favorite animal. Where are you? You know, no honey badger. Maybe it's just under badger. B. Sorry about that. Let me navigate this book. Hmm. For some reason. There we go. 142. Here we go. Here is the wonderful honey badger at the top. This one at the top right. He is very, very cool. Probably one of the most aggressive animals that you find around. And I know my friend James doesn't like us using the word aggressive, or he doesn't like to use it. But these animals are small, and they chase lions, they chase leopards. They are not scared of anything. I've been chased by them before, and it is quite a frightening experience. But they have so much attitude, and just physically, physically strong. So I'm sorry if you're losing the audio. I did damage my microphone in the wet weather, so I'll try and keep still. But that is my favorite animal and uh, I would love to show you one. They are an animal that is known to be crepuscular. Now what that means is they're active at dusk and dawn. This is the kind of time of day when they are most active and they're running around looking for insects and scorpions. They will feed on snakes. They'll actually kill snakes and eat them and if they get bitten by snakes they do not die. So that makes them even cooler, don't you think? The very elusive honey badger. And the black and white you saw on the back, the, white was, the back was white and the body was black, shows animals that they are dangerous. Grant, what are the black things on the road? Maybe we passed something before. It was a big black ball like that. That was a big pile of elephant dung. It's very black now because of the water. But maybe I'll find another one for you and show you. Elephants deposit huge balls of dung on the road as they feed on all of the leaves and vegetation. They move around and they drop these really large dung piles, which are full of, there we go, there's one sense. I'm going to grab it for you quickly. Just hold on for me for a second. Yes, I'm going to grab elephant dung with my hands. Okay, here we go. I'm going to come back around. Here it is. That is a big pile of dung, and that is only one. It comes out in probably about five or six of those big balls, and then they fall on the ground. But inside, I'm going to just break it open and throw that little bit away. Inside, there is particles of grass. There are particles of, of trees. This time of year, because it's green and there's lots of rain, the elephants feed mainly on the grass but in the winter time because it's our summer now as it starts to get dry they start feeding on the leaves and the branches and the twigs and the roots of lots of the trees so you'll get lots more of that in the diet so that is a nice big pile of elephant dung wipe it off on my pants all good 
So I hope that answers your question, but very important for the environment because the organic material from the tree is moved around and lots and lots of insects live inside the dung. So when we see them, you probably noticed I didn't drive over it, I drove around it not to squash it because inside can be hundreds, hundreds and thousands of little, little bugs. So it's important that we don't squash them because they're important for everything that goes on out here. And then lots of small birds and medium-sized birds will feed on the dung, on the insects. And it's very important for the system to have this environment and to have these ecosystems. And that ball itself is all, everything inside is phenomenal. Um, one thing that you can do is you can actually burn it. You can burn the dung. It's got quite a strong smell and it keeps away mosquitoes. So we have a lot of mosquitoes in Africa and a lot of mosquitoes responsible for malaria, which is a, a disease that can kill you. So it's quite nice to use the elephant dung to burn to keep those mosquitoes away. Okay, so we're going to continue on south and we're going to go over to my friend Taylor, who's got something hiding in the grass. got something in the grass but it's not alive now last year and also in oh, 2016 actually 2015 2016 were really really bad years for the animals especially in this area because there wasn't very much water there wasn't much rain and lots of them died during the drought so there was no grass there was no leaves there was absolutely nothing for the sad animals to eat but it made it very easy for things like leopards and lions to catch all sorts of animals because they were quite weak. And the lions, being the biggest cats in Africa, decided that it was quite easy to catch their favorite food, which is a buffalo. So those are the bones that you're looking at at the moment, all in the grass. It's the leftovers, bits and pieces of buffalo. I can't see the skull, though, so I can't see the head. So I think that those naughty hyenas that can eat bones and often come and scavenge and eat the last of the scraps of whatever the lions have left behind, I think that they must have dragged it somewhere because sometimes, and it sounds a little bit gross, but sometimes the hyenas are the only ones that can break open the head and then eat the brain. I mean, they're like zombies, I suppose, eating brains, hey? But the brain will be very delicious and lots and lots of nutrients for them to eat. So that was quite cool to see. But we're not even on a road anymore. We've moved off the road. The reason why we did that is because we are looking for that leopard. But we haven't found it yet. But I'm determined. Oh, there's the skull. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to show it to you because it's under some tall grass. And I have got a roof on the car. And also, this is something that you must all remember. I'm just going to watch carefully that I don't drive into a stump here. You must never pick up something that you don't know, especially when you're out in the bush, because you can get bacteria, can make you very sick and send you to hospital, You could, you, something could be poisonous. So I don't like to pick up bones, and um, we try and leave them alone. But I'll pick up horns and things, but it didn't look like there were any horns in that grass. But also now it's starting to get a little bit dark, so I don't want to be spending too much time outside the car. Ooh. Now, we're driving around, and I know we haven't seen many animals, but I promise you they're out here somewhere. And Mrs. Nicholson, you were wondering, what other animals do we have out here in the park? Well, I think we should talk about the animals that we could maybe see now at night time. So, of course, we're looking for leopards. We're looking for lions. Something else that we're looking for, which I'll be very excited to show you, is a chameleon. Have any of you seen a chameleon before? Hopefully, if you haven't, I'll be able to show you. Just one. Then we are looking for owls because they also come up. Maybe something like a bush baby. I bet none of you even have any idea what a bush baby is. Let me see if I've got a mammals book here. Let me quickly go through this little dip and just jump out the other side because sometimes the picture can break up here and we don't want that to happen. I'm sure I bought a mammals book with me. I'm just going to park the car right here. Oh yeah, this car is called Jigger, by the way. All our cars have names. Right, let's do some digging. Maybe in my secret box. Where I keep my camera. Let me put that up here. And try and undo it. Not much room in here. I don't. I'm so sorry, everybody. Oh no, wait, is it hiding? No. 
I've only got a butterfly book and a bird book, so I can't show you a picture of a bush baby. But I know Steve has got a mammal's book with him, so maybe when you go back and you visit Steve, he'll be kind enough to show you what a bush baby looks like. Wouldn't that be cool? And they're going to be bouncing from tree to tree. So you've got to be quick when you're searching for them. You've got to be so, 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 so quick. Uh, what else could we see tonight? David, what's your favorite nocturnal creature? So that's... That's what we call the nighttime animals. Ah, here we go. David says he likes civet. So there we go. Maybe my friend Steve can help you also show you a picture of a civet. It's a crazy looking thing. It looks like a cat and a raccoon put together. It's strange, but maybe Steve will be able to show you. And he's got his mammals book out, so I think he's paging through trying to find those animals. Let's go and see if he can find the bush baby and the civet. I do have my book, Taylor, and boys and girls, you must remember to always have your books with you and to always do your homework. Now, I've got two of them here. They're also known as Galagos, and uh, let's see if we can get that. See that one up there? The top one is called a thick-tailed bush baby, and they are quite big in comparison. They're about 70 to 80 centimeters, so almost, almost two and a half ruler lengths. Whereas the one on the bottom, this is the lesser, look at those ears, look at those eyes. I'm going to show you another picture of him now on the other page. There he is in the tree. How cute is that? He's standing there while holding on the branches. They love the trees and they feed on insects as well as the gum. They like to jump around the tree and dig their teeth. You can see these very sharp, these very sharp teeth over here. They dig those into the bark of the tree and then they drink the juice like maple syrup. And I'm sure all of you out there enjoy your maple syrup with your pancakes. The only thing is they don't have pancakes. They just have the syrup and insects. Tasty, tasty. I think another one you asked to see was the African civet. Let me find you the civet. Let me just practice my book again. Civet, 160. One second. Almost there. Here we go. There he is. Some people think it looks similar to a raccoon. See the black and white. Now these animals, they smell very, very bad. So bad that no animals eat them. Some animals might kill them from time to time, such as leopard and lion, but they have such a disgusting smell and they eat very disgusting insects that animals leave them alone and you see the black and white, like the honey badger, the black and white is a warning. It's basically, sorry about the glare, it's basically telling other animals at night, don't come for me, there's something wrong. I either I'm dangerous or poisonous or taste very bad. And in the case of the civet, they do. They taste very, very bad. They were actually used a very long time ago to make that very strong smell in perfume, but a very long time ago. They don't use that anymore. And I think that was very cruel to do. That was extracting that from a gland in the civet, and it was something called civetone. You love honey badgers? That is your class mascot. I absolutely love all of you now. That is my favorite, favorite animal. And I think you have chosen probably the coolest mascot out there. I wonder if you've watched any videos on honey badgers. There are lots of them on YouTube. You should watch them and see how cool they are. I really like their attitude and how they run around. And one time I was sitting in a pride of lions. I, I was sitting, the lions were lying here. There was about 20 lions lying like this. And a honey badger came running from the side with all the attitude in the world. And he didn't notice the lions. And suddenly he was inside the lions. They all jumped up, looked at him, and he went, hur, hur. And the lions all went, go through, sir. And they let the honey badger run straight out the other side. And he just kept running. A lion didn't even attempt to go for him because he just said, I am too aggressive for you. And lions look at animals like that and go, that's way too much work for just a little bit of meat. And I don't think the honey badger tastes very good either. You know, they're very tough. Their skin is very, very strong. I once watched a video of a leopard taking about 45 minutes to kill a honey badger and then he let it go because it was just too much work. 
Okay, so we are almost at Chitwa Dam again. The lightning is still in the distance there. Hopefully we don't get caught in it. We're going to go to Scott, who has got a tree. Yes, we've got a tree, but there's an animal in the tree that we would like to show you. It's quite tricky because it's very windy, but you can see there's a little pale shape there. There it is. That's called a catydid. It's almost kind of like a grasshopper, but they're nocturnal. And what actually caught my attention was its pale shade. I thought it may have been a baby chameleon, which would have been absolutely awesome. They lo look a very similar color, and if Seb zooms out a bit more... You'll see what, I, what I'm looking for when I'm looking for chameleon. You see how that little bug is a slightly different color to the rest of the leaves in this tree. And that's exactly what you're looking for when you are hoping to find a chameleon after dark with the spotlights. And it looks like this little guy is just chilling out for now. It may be nibbling on those leaves. But for now it's bedtime. Grant, you would like to know why is it so dark? Because it's the morning over there. And it's a good question, Grant. Hello, everyone. Um, there's some other tourists driving past us. And Grant, basically, how, it, how the world works um, is that, and this isn't a good example, but I'll use it anyway. Uh, when you generally look at a map of the world, Africa is usually here in the middle, and America is on the left-hand side of the map and uh, Australia and New Zealand and those countries are on the right hand side and how the time zones work because the sun rises and sets at different times in different parts of the world so right now the sun has set here in South Africa which means it's disappeared from us but it's risen in America so it's all different um, you are behind us okay so we are in the future basically um, we're going to go into, what's tomorrow? Friday. So our Friday will start in five hours' time. But your Friday will only start in probably about 12 or even more hours in that time. And Australia, it's already Friday there. It's probably midnight in Australia. So each different country, depending where on the world you are, has got different time zones. So if you ever go on holiday, you'll have to change your watch if you do change time zones. And even in America, between the East Coast and the West Coast, there are different time zones because you guys live in such a big country. I hope that helps. Um, it's quite tricky to understand and explain. But I hope that helped you, Grants. Good. Okay, well, that was a false alarm. I really was hoping it was a chameleon, but we've still got some time to not only find a chameleon, but maybe a leopard. Who knows what else we could bump into after rain. The snakes like to slither about. And that would be lovely to see. We don't see snakes very often. They're one of my favorite animals to view. Uh, and importantly, uh, it's, it's good that you know that snakes are usually very scared of humans. So we, that's why we don't see them a lot. There's lots of snakes here, but they hide from us. They don't want to have, to do, have anything to do with us. And it's only usually when you're trying to catch them or kill them that they actually try and defend themselves and bite you. It's not very often that you're sleeping in bed and a snake slithers up and bites you on the nose. It's when we're trying to be nasty to them. So always remember that with snakes. I know a lot of people all around the world are very scared of them. But as long as you give them the respect that they need and the space that they need, they will avoid you just as much as you want to avoid them. There's a bird on the road here. Now I'm going to turn off my lights. And we're going to use the infrared light that we've got on the vehicle, which basically is a special light that lets us see after dark without interfering with the animals. Oh, no. It flew off. Let's check further down the road. No. Let me use my spotlight quickly. Oh, it fluttered off. Anyway, um, now we're back to the regular light. And it's important that you guys know why we like to use the infrared lights. It's so that we don't interfere with what the animals are doing. Obviously, if you shine a big bright spotlight like I'm using here in anyone's face, it's not going to be very pleasant. So we just like to do it to find the animals. And as soon as we find the animals, then we switch over 
to the invisible infrared light that only the camera is clever enough to see with. And it really is wonderful how modern technology and all the incredible things that some very clever people around the world are making actually help us out on safari. So we loving all the advancements and toys that we're getting as the years go by. Okie dokie, well, I'm hoping we're going to find you a chameleon and a leopard sooner rather than later. I'm not too sure what Steve is hoping to find you guys. Thank you very much. Look at what we found in the dam. We've got a mama hippo submerged there in the water, and if you pay careful attention on the right-hand side of her head, just wait for it. You'll see a baby pop up there. There it is. Look at that. Unbelievable. One of the largest land mammals in the world, and it is sitting right here in the water. It's getting ready for um, coming out uh, at night. The hippos like to go out and feed. Like the elephant, they like to feed on grass, except they feed on grass all the time. They don't feed on leaves and branches like the elephant do. And this female, you can tell that the baby is very young because she's separated from the, the rest of the hippos. If the baby was a bit older, she'd be a bit closer to them. But because the baby's very young and she doesn't want it to get squashed because the hippos are big, round, heavy animals, she likes to go away from the rest and to keep her baby safe that way. If we listen, you just heard the hippo calling there. <laughs> Julian, that is a question everybody wants to know. Have I ever had an animal sneak up on me? Animals are not sneaky, Julian. Human beings are sneaky. Animals, they have intentions. They show you their, their body language and then they carry it out. But animals out here most of the time are actually quite afraid of us. But then we don't go walking at night. At daytime we can walk because we can see, but at night time, uh, lions and elephants, not sorry, lions and leopards are then very active and they have no fear of us at night. So I've never been snuck up on by one, but don't walk at night, Julian, that is the way to go forward. And if you come out here on safari, make sure you listen to your guides and the people in charge and do what they do, and I promise you, everything will be fine. Okay, so that hippo, we're going to leave her in the water as she's probably going to go out pretty soon to go feeding. We could hear a few of them in the distance just before you came to us. Um, and they're going to go out on their nightly feed. Oh, there goes my lights. So wonderful how the temperatures changed from earlier. It was so warm. It was almost 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Layla, how fast do leopards run? That is a very good question. Now, leopards can run about 23 meters a second. So that is about 60, 70 feet in a second. That's pretty fast at their full charging speed. Okay, so now at, when they're running, they can run at about 91 kilometers an hour. So that is about 40, 40 odd miles an hour. So it's very, very fast. But leopards and lions don't run very fast for very long. They run very fast over a very short distance. Sorry about the bumps here. They run, they try to get as close as they can. So like what Julian said, they sneak up on animals, other animals, not on us. And then once they get very close, they launch themselves at that very fast speed and then they catch them. Okay, we're going to go over to Taylor and see what she has got for you this afternoon. Well, remember how we were talking about what animals we can see at night? Here's one of them. It's not an owl, though. It's, of course, it's a bird, but it's a very special bird. It's called a night jar. Now, this one is actually a fiery-necked night jar, and they have the coolest call. I'm going to search for it while I tell you about this uh, bird. Now, they are nocturnals. Remember I said to you that's what we call animals that like to come out at night. It's nocturnal. And then if they are around during the day, we call it diurnal, for daytime. And 
This bird is sitting on the road in the open now, and the reason why it's doing this is because it's waiting for any insects to fly over the top of its head. So it's got really, really good eyesight, but it's not going to see that bird, uh, not the bird, the insect, um, it's all its colors. It's actually going to see the silhouette. So it's going to see the shadow. You know, if you put something in front of the sun, how it becomes quite black, that's, all we, that's a silhouette. And that's exactly what will happen. The insects will fly over the top of its head and, and then it will swoop up. It's like an acrobat, really. And then catch the insect and bring it down to the ground and then gobble it up. And you see, that's why it's looking up in the air all the time, constantly moving its head around, trying to spot any little insects. And also, while it sits and waits, it's just going to fix its feathers. Now, birds have to constantly keep preening themselves. So that's also what, that's the word we use when, um, when we're talking about birds grooming themselves or cleaning themselves we call it preening and in order for them to fly and especially a nightjar that needs to swoop up very quickly it needs to make sure that all its feathers are in check oh it just flew up and away i thought it was going to land back down on the ground again so they've got little hooks on their feathers and if you ever find a feather in the park or maybe outside at school if you take it and you pull it a little bit and you make the feathers all messy then you, you hold it gently and you pull hang on i might even be able to show you let me, uh, let me get my box of tricks again. Let me look in here. And unclip it. The reason why, I put that over there. Oh, fingers stuck. I haven't got much room in this car. I have a blue book with lots of really cool feathers in it, actually. Um, I've got a secret compartment. Everything's getting... There we go. Look. Which feather are we going to get? Which feather are we going to get? I've got lots of nice feathers in here. Let's take one from... Oh, a nightjar feather. Ha! Huh. Yeah, let's go back to color. So we're in the infrared now. So this is actually quite cool. In fact, this feather, you'll see it's lovely colors. I'm going to hold it a little bit closer so I can get some more of the light on. Is that all right, David? So look there. So that feather is actually from a nightjar. And now what I wanted to show you is you can see it's all nice. You can do that. Yeah. So it looks like the bird was caught in a storm. It was out in the rain. Now it needs to fix itself. So what it will do, it will take its beak and it will run its beak through the feathers like that. And do it to the other side. Obviously it will take a little bit longer than I'm doing it. Perfect. Back to normal. So there's tiny little hooks that we can't really see, but I bet if you put it under a microscope, you could see the little hooks, and they all realign with one another. So there we go. You can go home and you can show your mom, your dad, your sisters, your brothers a really cool trick. Very nice, don't you think? And it's got beautiful camouflage on it as well. All nice and brown. Let me put that back because I like to collect feathers, the ones that I find. Shall we see what other feathers I've got in here? I think so. What? That's another night jar feather. I almost can't see in here. This one doesn't look like much. But just on the tip over here, you can see that's actually yellow feathers there. And this feather is from a bird called a African green pigeon. So it's a very, very pretty pigeon, I promise. You're probably thinking, but Taylor, pigeons get them everywhere. This is a special one. And I'm going to see what else I can find. I've got a really amazing one in here that I'm actually trying to dig for you. Are you ready for this one? This is my favorite feather. Let me make it look beautiful first before I show you. I have to show you first. Okay, look at this. How cool is this feather? Hey, blue, beautiful and blue. And look how long it is. Look at it in comparison to the size of my hand, how massive it is. And it's got a long streamer on the end. So this is from a bird called the lilac breasted roller. And it's got purple on it, it's got blue, it's got white, but this is the end of the tail. And the males, uh, I think the females also have them, they've got these beautiful long little feathers. We call it a streamer. Very cool. So you know when you have a party and you have streamers, it's kind of the same thing. But I have got some more feathers, but they're not in this book, unfortunately. They're all a little too big to be kept in here. So they're at home. I've got vulture feathers, I've got all sorts of other things. But let's carry on. Let's see if we can find anything else. I was hoping to see some more frogs after the rain, but this area didn't really look like it got much rain at all. It, it seemed to have passed it. 
Bert spot, uh, spot, Scott has got his spotlight out, and I was telling you about chameleons, so maybe if you ask Scott very, very nicely, he'll try and find you a chameleon. You don't even have to ask me nicely, I'm already trying. I don't know where Taylor found all of her feathers, but I'm quite interested by that. Beautiful f feathers on the green pigeon, so very happy that you got to see those. Now, we've come back to a bush where a chameleon was seen a few days ago. And I'm hoping that it might still be hanging around the same area. No sign of it just yet. Come on, where are you hiding? Cole, you'd like to know if we have any poisonous snakes here. And the answer to that question is yes and no. Now, you might be scratching your head, as would I. And the reason being is that the, the, the word that you used is not the correct word, but it's not your fault. And lots of people often say poisonous snakes. But no snakes are poisonous because poison is something that you need to eat. So unless you would like to eat a snake uh, and then get poisoned by it, then no snakes are poisonous. And even their venom that they bite you with, and that can be dangerous, even if you drink their venom, it's not poison. It won't hurt you unless you've got some big cuts in your mouth that that, poison, uh, that, that venom can get into your bloodstream. It's going to cause no trouble for you. So the correct word to use is venom, venomous snakes. And yes, we do have lots of venomous snakes. And snakes basically have three different types of venom. Um, some of their venom makes your skin and flesh fall off. It rots your flesh. Other venom makes you bleed permanently. And usually when you would get a scab on a wound, your body can't make scabs anymore. And you just continue to bleed and bleed. And you can even start bleeding from your eyes and your nose. Um, so that's a horrible one to get. That's the second type. And the third type of venom attacks your heart and uh, all of your organs and your brain. So your body will slowly shut down. So three different types of venom. And we've got snakes that have all the different types of venom here. So like I said earlier, though, thankfully, the snakes are not out to get us. And they are not horrible animals. They will only bites us if as a general rule if we're being horrible to them oh isabel well you've been lucky enough to find some snakes in your own backyard and that's really cool you said it was a garter snake which if i'm correct is a very very pretty snake um seb if you just zoom into the middle of where the spotlight is mm -hmm. there's a praying mantis in there literally just below that big branch a little bit to the right there it is just on the top of your screen now if you zoom in a oh there it jumps so there's a praying mantis a kind of predatory insect that looks like it's jumping around trying to find itself dinner and they're quite an interesting insect because their two front legs are modified usually all insects have got six legs but these guys use four for walking and moving and their front two legs are just used for hunting now sadly I can't see it anymore it's disappeared behind some bushes but you may have got a glimpse of it as it kind of jumped from one branch to another okay well I'm gonna continue we've still got a little bit of time where we can hopefully find you some more animals and while I do that we're gonna send you back to Steve Thank you very much. We've come across a bird. There is running. It is called a water thickeny or a spotted. I can't really see, but it's a nocturnal bird, and we are in infrared, so we can see this bird at night. Um, and it has got a scorpion in its mouth. Isn't that fantastic? It has got a scorpion that has probably came out of its burrow because of the rain, and is now running around with a scorpion. It was right in front of the car. Now it's a bit shy, and it's run away a bit. But you see how big the eyes are on the bird? 
um, it means that it likes to be active at night. They are very nocturnal, and because they've got big eyes, it means they can see. Can you see that? Oh, he's going to swallow it. You've just seen a kill, boys and girls. He's going to smack. Oh, whoopsie. Straight down the throat. There's a, the, the sting is still sticking out. Look at that. Just slurped it in. Wow. Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> oh, shake his head. Now, uh, birds don't have teeth like we do, so they will take scorpion like that and probably smash it on a log or on a rock or something until it gets nice and soft, and then they put it inside their throat before swelling. And off he goes. There we go. That was fantastic. Well done, Seb. How cool was that? Called a water... I think that was a water thickening. I didn't get a proper look at it. Seb's trying to find the, the buttons to take off the infrared, but he is, he is floundering in the dark. There we go. And there's me in infrared. I've probably got some really crazy eyes. <laughs> How marvelous was that? A water or a spotted thickening. They are very similar, uh, but the spot, the spot, it's got a bit few more spots and occurs a little bit further away from water where the water thickening, as the name says, is quite close to water. But we're not far from the dam. But anyway, it was a thickening and it had a scorpion. It looked like one of the small um, Epistacanthus species, but don't worry. It's just a three-banded scorpion. How nice was that? Okay, well, we've got our spotlight, and we are in a search of anything that's moving around at night. We saw some night jars already. I think Taylor showed you. And we, we might find an elephant, not an elephant, a leopard on the way home. And if we do, we'll come straight back just for the action. But while we're doing so, we're going to go to Taylor, who I think is also in infrared. And she's going to show you a beautiful antelope. We do, we do. This impala is coughing, though. Careful, it's cold, it's been raining. I hope you don't get sick, mister. But look how many there are. There's not just one, there's just eyes everywhere, and it's kind of creepy because you can see the impala. I cannot see anything. It is complete darkness here. So, it, we sh yes, okay, what we're going to do is don't get a fright. We're going to turn the lights off now so that we can show you. David had a great idea. We're going to show you what we can see. Have a look. <gasps> Gone. Complete black. There we go. And there's that special light on that's not affecting these animals. We can see all the impala. Now, it's been very windy. It's been rainy. And I bet these impala would have been a little bit on the nervous side. So what they've done is they've come up to this big open area. We're quite close to camp as well. And the reason why they've come out here is that if there is any stars or any moon that can poke through the clouds, what will happen is that these impala will be able to see. Remember how we were talking about the silhouette? And they'll be able to see any predators trying to come close to them. Because the impala, unfortunately, don't have very good eyesight at all. The lions, the leopards, they've all got much better eyesight than the impalas have. So out here they feel a little bit safer. Nobody can sneak behind a bush and try and hide away from them. They'll have a better chance of maybe getting away. But they're all on high alert. Ears pricked listening to everything that's going on around them. I bet they're feeling a little bit more relaxed now that the wind has died down. Because when the wind blows, it becomes very, 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 very difficult for the impala to hear. And that's what they're going to be relying on most now at night. But I hope that you all at Tomahawk School have had a lot of fun today. It's been great having you on our, on our safari vehicles. And I'm sure Scott and Steve are saying exactly the same thing. And we hope you learnt a little bit. But we'll see you all next time. And to our regular viewers, remember to join in tomorrow for the Sunrise Safari.